So what is the oldest scripture? We have to sometimes wonder, what is a scripture anyway? The scripture is some uh, ancient writing that tells us something about God. The oldest scripture in the world are the Vedas, the ancient writings of India. They were written down 5,000 years ago, but actually, they existed before 5,000 years ago. They've existed for uh, since the dawn of creation, actually. <coughs> so, today we are uh, doing another session of stories from the Vedas, and I thought it would be appropriate to actually talk about the Vedas and the main three people who, through whose mouth and ears we hear the Srimad Bhagavatam. So that is Sukadeva Goswami, Maharaj Parikhid, and uh, of course, the book we're talking about in this case is Srimad Bhagavatam. So this is November 14th, stories from the Vedas, Sukadeva Parikhid, and the Bhagavatam. We are here every Thursday from 7 till about 8, 8.30, sometimes 9. And we have some explanation, either with stories from the Vedas or we do the What's Up With That series as well, which discusses the paranormal. The YouTube channel, in case you see this on some other uh, platform, is Krishna Was Up. So that's the actual um, um, YouTube channel. need a pop screen. Otherwise my peas will pop out. Okay, so this particular session is about Bhagavatam and uh, this is, as you'll see on the screen here, Sukadev and Parikit. This is Sukadev in the chair in the blue colored skin and Parikit on his knees in front. Parikit is a king and Sukadev is a wandering mendicant, a wandering sage, who is the direct son of Veda Vyas, who has written the Vedas. So this is how the Bhagavatam is spoken through the mouth of Sukadev. And Parikit is a person asking questions to try to understand spiritual life, what it is and what it means. Okay, so... <clears throat> Can you clo close the door, please? And, and wa watch the wires. You don't have to say please. It's okay. It's okay. So, uh, the process of the Vedic knowledge is um, understanding what spiritual life really is. All over the world we have religions and all over the world we have various spiritual paths. And we want to know something about what the goal of these spiritual paths is. Where are we really heading? And we want to know how authoritative these uh, bits of information are. 
And they come usually, most of the uh, religions of the world come from some kind of scripture, ancient writings. Now the Vedas are vast. There are four Vedas, 180 Upanishads, 18 Puranas, uh, um, and a whole bunch of literatures that are derived from the Vedas, which is also sometimes called Samhitas. So there's thousands of books. Obviously, it would be very difficult to study such a vast literature. <coughs> but thankfully, it's not necessary. We only need to study, really, the Srimad Bhagavatam and the Bhagavad Gita, because these books are the ones that really discuss the path of bhakti. And uh, partly we'll talk about why that is, uh, what the rest of the Vedas actually talk about. So today, in an overview, we're going to be talking about what is this Srimad Bhagavatam, when it was spoken and its purpose, and we'll contrast ancient philosophy and modern philosophy. We'll talk a little bit about worldviews, and we'll talk a little bit about the Bhagavatam's author, Veda Vyas. We'll talk about his son Sukadev, who is the person giving knowledge in this particular um, book, and Brickett, who is a king who has been cursed to die in seven days. So he's been given a curse, and he will use his last remaining seven days on this earth to try to understand what life was about. Actually, we all should try to understand what life is about. And uh, when we try to understand what life is about, then our life has meaning. We don't have to wait till the last moments before we leave the body. That's uh, a poor time to think about what life's about because we won't make any kind of decisive changes before we leave the world. Life should be about understanding who we are, who God is, and developing a relationship with God. And that should be started at the earliest point in someone's life. Otherwise, we'll live a life, live a life of just making ends meet financially and making some reputation or some uh, nest in the world, only to have it all shattered at the time of death, because no one is able to live forever. All right, so this is kind of what I hope to go over, and uh, we'll talk a little bit more here. This is Srimad Bhagavatam in a modern form. You notice we're not using uh, leaves of the Ashavata tree or some other kind of leaves to write on, we're using normal book form. And the Bhagavatam is 18,000 verses, it's huge. This is a, uh, I think, uh, about a 20 book set or something thereabouts. And the Bhagavatam is written in 12 cantos, each of which have an average of 20 to 30 um, chapters with the 10th canto being the exception, which has 90 chapters, so the 10th canto is the biggest one. And this was all written down uh, 5,000 years ago. Vyasadev actually didn't put the pen to the medium. What Vyasadev did was spoke, and Ganesh actually wrote the Vedas down. So, um, after having written the Four Vedas, after having written the Upanishads, after having written so many other literatures, and they were compiled, and after all this was done, Vyasadeva decided to write a history. He felt that in this age of Kali Yuga, people's memories are not very good. So therefore, because their memories are bad, then uh, people should learn philosophy through the agency of the story. When we hear a story, we automatically identify with the characters, and we wonder what makes them tick, why they do what they do. And in the Bhagavatam, we'll hear many stories. There's all kinds of stories. Some of them interweave with other stories, some of them do not. And some of the characters are doing the right thing, and some of the characters are doing the wrong thing. And through their lives, we learn about what the spiritual process is. We learn why we're talking about going to develop a loving relationship with God. What that means, how to do it. So in these 12 cantos, the 10th canto of the 12 discusses particularly the pastimes of the Supreme Lord, and his name is Krishna. 
Well, God has many names all throughout the world, but the name that we know him by in the Vedic literatures is Krishna. So he is specifically focused on and mentioned in this Srimad Bhagavatam. The other Vedic literatures discuss mostly what we call poverty mark or the process of living a pious way according to Vedic restrictions so that we can go to the heavenly planets when we die and while we're here on earth to enjoy the earthly um, facilities that this planet gives us. But that is not really the purpose of spiritual life and that's why we don't uh, actually make an effort or any, uh, we don't actually recommend people to read all the Vedas. If we just read Srimad Bhagavatam and Bhagavad Gita and Chaitanya Charitamrita, that's sufficient. But that's quite a, a chunk in itself. Here we have 18,000 verses in about 20 some odd books. So this is Srimad Bhagavatam. And Srimad Bhagavatam was written by Vyasadeva when he felt that there was something missing in his presentation of the Vedas. He'd written all these other thousands of books and something was missing. And what he f discovered was missing. He felt that he had spoken about many important spiritual topics like the path of jnana or knowledge, the path of yoga, he talked about the path of karma, and many other types of things, but he had not really mentioned what bhakti is. Well, he had mentioned it, but it was just mixed in with everything else so that a person who was uh, hearing the Vedas or reading the Vedas would have no idea that bhakti was actually important. It was just like everything else. Uh, you can, it's like a smorgasbord, you can choose whatever you like to do. And many people in India are of this opinion that we basically choose whatever aspect of the spiritual discipline that we um, feel some resonance with. But this is not really the uh, understanding of the Vedas. The Vedas really want to bring us to the point of serving God, understanding who God is, understanding that we should serve Him, and understanding what we mean by the idea of serving God. So understanding who God is, understanding that we should serve Him, and understanding what we mean by service to God. This is what the bhakti scriptures are. This is what the Vaishnava uh, system is all about. It is not focused on enjoying in this material world. It's not focused on uh, going to the heavenly worlds or going to heaven as people think of it in modern terms. It's not focused on becoming void or becoming one with God. It's not focused on experiencing some mystic mental state as sometimes the yogis do. So these are not the goals of the Vedas and this is not the goal of Srimad Bhagavatam. Srimad Bhagavatam does not talk about these things. So I'm trying to move quickly here because I'm trying to cover a lot of ground and I'm trying to get myself to make much, much shorter videos and presentations than I usually have been. So bear with me, we'll see if I can carry through on my hope. This is a little bit of contrast between ancient and modern philosophy. Uh, <clears throat> the difference between ancient philosophy and modern philosophy is in what is actually important. In modern philosophy, we want to know the details of how the universe exactly works in every respect. But this is not what's important according to ancient philosophy. What's important is understanding God and our relationship with Him because that ultimately counts in the long run. Whereas simply understanding how material nature does some particular thing that it does is scarcely on the same level. Of course, People want to know how the material world works, and certainly the Srimad Bhagavatam does speak about that. It explains to some extent how the world works. But we also have to keep in mind that the material world is infinitely dense, and it's doing many unbelievable things, things that we could never understand. Uh, if we focus our whole lifetime, perhaps we could understand some of them. But we'll have actually wasted our life studying what is not really that important. And of course, what is verifiable? Um, 
in the modern world, we have this real strong sense of we have to check everything and understand it is absolutely correct. Of course, we should have some way of verifying things, but only certain things can be absolutely verified. And when you really try to get a sense of what can be absolutely verified, we find that there's not much that fits into that category. A lot of stuff can't be absolutely verified, yet the things that can't be verified are important and we have to come to some conclusion about them, verified or no. So the Vedas talk about what's the difference between things that are eternal and temporary. This is one of the more important I items. I apologize. I'm, I am on uh, the bottom of my heart. I am so sorry. Uh, I, I appreciate everything. Uh. Everything. Everything about you. Uh -huh. Everything. Everything. God bless you. Uh -huh. God bless you. All right. You have something you were going to say? or No, no I, I just I want to get every piece of okay. information. Okay. Like, I, I am so sorry. All right. I wish I had something where I could write down. Uh, yeah, I don't have anything for you to write on today. I usually bring something, but I didn't today. All right, let's uh, continue though. So the Vedas are talking about the difference between eternal and temporary. So eternal things are what the real topic or the real subject of the Vedas is. Because there are many things in this world that are temporary. There's no doubt that things are changing constantly. But some things don't change. What are those things? That's what the Vedas are actually talking about. That's why the Vedas are timeless because they talk mostly and specifically, specifically about those things which never change. And that in Sanskrit is called sat or eternal. And things which do change are asa, which are things that are temporary. So we see that many things can't be quantified. Uh, our modern world is very much uh, fond and uh, in, in, engrossed in numbers. And unless we can talk about things in numbers and come up with equations, we're not sure that what we're dealing with is reality. But there's so many things that can't be quantified in uh, numbers. Some things can, and okay, nothing wrong with that. But um, there's so many things that can't be, and we have to still come to some understanding and some conclusion about them. And of course, in the ancient times, what counts as evidence is the Vedas themselves, because they are coming from the spiritual world. And we can say, well, how do we know that they're coming spiritual world if somebody says so? But actually, to come up with a philosophy that's very broad, to come up with a philosophy that's not self-contradictory, and a philosophy that does answer a lot of basic questions about how things go on, that's not something that can be faked. So evidence comes from the Vedic literatures and in the modern world we usually think evidence comes from what we see and hear. But even we see in the material world, in the scientific realm, not everything is based on evidence of just simply what we see and hear. All right, so um, in the modern world only natural causes are considered. We cannot tolerate hearing about the supernatural, uh, whereas what is the real distinction between natural and supernatural? There are just different ways that material nature works, but uh, there's a prejudice. So many things can't be proven, and we can see that there is this line in science between actual science and speculation. Certain things can be demonstrated in a laboratory, they can be demonstrated over and over again. We can hear about them and we can verify them in some way, but there are many things that get talked about in scientific uh, discussions which can't be gotten into a laboratory, which can't be verified uh, over and over again, and yet we still think of them as science. So there's a gray line between these things. We see that in ancient uh, writings or ancient philosophy, not even just the Sanskrit or the Vedic system, even in other systems like the Greek system that Philosophy was intended to give a person a clue of how they should live. 
But we see that in modern uh, philosophy, generally, never, nothing ever boils down to how we change the way we live, how we change the way we do things, how we have uh, a change in our attitude to others. These things are actually essential in real philosophy. But in modern philosophy, they get lost in the ozone. So um, we are seeing that modern knowledge or modern philosophy is constantly being updated and constantly changing, which means that we are not studying the uh, things that are eternal. We're studying things that are either changing in our view or things that are not eternal. Otherwise, we wouldn't be updating our knowledge constantly. Um, we notice that this statue here of knowledge, and she doesn't have a head for some reason. <laughs> so uh, uh, this is kind of the way our knowledge is today. There is no doubt that science and our modern philosophical way of looking things can certainly understand how to make jumbo jets and computer chips. And these can do miraculous things. But can they tell us about what the universe is and what our place is in it? Certainly people will soapbox and say that our um, modern scientific investigations do tell us about these things, but generally we don't find any real scientific basis in what they say. They're just sort of speculations that get extrapolated from some theories which again can't be evidenced in themselves. So, of course, everyone has a worldview. It's impossible to live without a worldview. We have to have one. And um, worldviews are, are the way we see everything, how we tie things together, what we count as important. This is what a worldview is. And some people borrow their worldview from science, some from mathematics, some from philosophy, some from religious traditions. <coughs> so whether or not you know it, you have a worldview. Everybody does. The question is, some people never examine their worldview. They just have one. We have to uh, examine the worldview. Otherwise, we may have pre-assumptions that are not realistic. People base their worldview on certain things that they take as given. And if we change what is taken as given, then the worldview would also change. Of course, to come in contact with changing one's worldview is a traumatic experience for most people. Uh, they find it very difficult to um, feel comfortable about changing their worldview. In fact, many times when people change their worldview, it takes some traumatic event to make that possible. And this, in the long run, is a good thing because uh, the material world is set up in such a way that you can believe anything you want. And the reason that is, is because the Supreme Lord has designed the material world to make it fuzzy around the edges, to make it difficult to evaluate in the details, and to make it so complex that it's constantly shifting. He makes it that way. And therefore, if you want to believe absolutely any kind of crazy thing, you can do it. And there is some pretext upon which you can build some kind of argument for that uh, particular way of looking at things. However, although you can do that, that doesn't change reality. And as time moves forward, reality will force itself upon you. If you have a worldview that's based on smoke and mirrors, Eventually, your whole world will crash down. You will feel empty and you will feel lost. If you have a genuine worldview, that will never occur. So this is the idea of spiritual life. And this is what the Bhagavatam is trying to get across. It's telling us about who we are and where we've come from and what we should be doing and why. So we're going to talk a little bit about the people who are the main co-locutors, uh, the people who are talking together. 
in the Srimad Bhagavatam. Of course, there are many conversations between different individuals in Srimad Bhagavatam, but the main one is between Rikit and Sukadeva Goswami. So Vyasadeva, he is the author of the Vedas. He's the son of Satyavati and Parasaramuni. He wrote the Vedic literature. He wrote it down about 5,000 years ago. And if we want to understand the Vedic literature, we have to understand it in a succession of people who have explained it the same way for thousands of years. If something's actually the truth, and something's actually realistic, it's the truth because it has an impact in the everyday real world, then it shouldn't be changing over thousands of years even, what to speak of changing within the same decade. <clears throat> so therefore, the Vedas have been spoken and commented upon by people for thousands of years with the same kind of commentary without changing the basic understanding of what the Vedas are trying to tell us. So for us to understand the Vedas, we have to understand them in the same way. Of course, it's up to us to understand who really does represent the Vedas properly in the original way. And the first question would be, do they come from a school? The second question is, are they a chain or a link from one guru to the next disciple, to the disciple becomes a guru, and then the next disciple, and then that disciple becomes a guru, and then the next disciple. So if there is this careful handing down of the same conclusions and rejecting certain erroneous conclusions, if this is seen throughout the centuries, then we know we have the genuine thing. So Vyasadeva wrote them, and then he wanted to summarize them with the Vedanta Sutra, but he summarized them very briefly and tersely in a way that was almost impossible to understand. So he finally decided to re-expand them into the Srimad Bhagavatam. But with Srimad Bhagavatam, he finally decided that this one book should be the real focus of the Vedas. This is what has the real deal. It talks about devotional service, and it does not at all talk about poverty marg or these lesser goals that Vedic literature sometimes talks to, like um, going to the heavenly planets or um, merging with the Brahman or understanding some kind of a unique mental um, consciousness of some sort or other. So as we said, the Vedas are, uh, Bhagavatam is 18,000 verses and describes mostly bhakti. And within the pages of Bhagavatam, we also hear the stories and pastimes of Krishna, who is the Supreme, which Veda Vyasa did not give primary focus to up until the Srimad Bhagavatam. So Veda Vyasa, although he wrote the Vedas 5,000 years ago, he's still living in the uh, Himalayas. Not only is he still living, at the end of Kali Yuga, which is uh, 427,000 years from now, he'll still be living then too. So some living entities have incredibly long spans of life. So, um, yeah, so this, uh, this uh, idea was that Veda Vyasa himself was disturbed because he felt there was something missing from the Vedas and his spiritual master, who we see in this picture, Narada Muni, agreed that there was something missing. Veda Vyasa felt that what was missing was he had spoken about many things, but he had not given prominence to bhakti. Whereas his teacher, Veda Vyasa's teacher, who is um, Narada Muni, said, what you have missed out is describing the activities and glories of the Supreme Lord Krishna. He had certainly described some activities of Krishna in the rest of the Vedas. But he did not give prominence to them, nor did he elaborate on them. So in the Srimad Bhagavatam, both of those faults are rectified. And in Srimad Bhagavatam, you won't find any eulogy, eulogy of other things that are unimportant, nor will we hear glorifications of other demigods who are also not important. We'll only hear about the Supreme Lord who is the source of everything, Krishna. All right, so um, that's Veda Vyas. Now Veda Vyas has a son, but before we talk about his son, we're gonna talk about Parikshit, who is a king. And Parikshit 
was uh, a king that took over after Krishna left the world, after the Pandavas left the world. He was the next in line for kingly succession. And he was a very powerful king. He was the last descendant in the line of Puru. And uh, he was able to push back Kali Yuga even. He was that powerful. Kali Yuga. So he, yeah. I'm so sorry. So we, I, I we can talk say about that it in a minute. Continue, it's not yeah. Really well, we'll be finished in a few minutes, and then we can talk no, about it. No, you can you can continue. Like I'm so sorry. Okay, so he was cursed to die in seven days. He um, used the last seven days of his life to try to understand the real purpose of spiritual life and the real purpose of life in general. So we went to the Ganges to fast until his death, which was to occur soon. While he was there, many sages gathered around him, and uh, each of them tried to give him some understanding of what the Vedas say, but they seemed to have contradictory explanations. But finally, Sukadeva Goswami came forward, and they all accepted him as the ultimate authority, and so the Bhagavatam is directly spoken to Pariket by Sukadev. All the other sages and holy men who were there at the Ganges where Pariket was uh, fasting till death, they stepped aside and they let Sukadev Goswami explain the real purpose of the Vedas to Pariket, who was cursed to die in seven days. So Sukadev Goswami, he was the son of Vyasadev. We just talked about Vyasadev. He was Vyasadev's son. So when he was born, he didn't want to come out of the womb. And Vyasadeva understood the reason he didn't want to come out of the womb was he didn't want to become entangled in the material world. So Vyasadeva spoke spiritual knowledge directly to Sukadeva in the womb. So where Sukadeva heard the Vedas was from the mouth of his father while he was yet in the womb. Finally, after many years, Sukadeva came out of the womb. but. Uh, he was not an infant when that happened, and this all is uh, this all occurred in a mystical way. Otherwise, it wouldn't have been possible the normal uh, way that humans are born. But when he came out of the womb, he was not an infant at that time, and he immediately left home because he'd been given the information he needed by his father, and he didn't need to stay around for anything. His father wanted him to uh, spend some time with the family, but. Uh, but Sukadev didn't want to waste his time at all, so he immediately left and he began to travel as if he were some kind of uh, madman. He didn't speak to people, he didn't communicate, he wandered around the earth completely naked. And Vyasadev was heartbroken, but Sukadev didn't want to become entangled. So when Pariket was cursed, he left his kingdom, his throne, he put someone else in charge, and he went to the Ganges just to meditate and wait for this time when he would have to leave the world. And there the sages gathered around him, and there it was, and Sukadeva Goswami happened upon the same scene. And uh, when Sukadeva Goswami saw the uh, sages gathered, and he saw Prickett waiting to learn what he should do before death, he was asked by all the sages to be the person to do the explanation, so he did. So this is the uh, section that we wanted to cover, that um, we've talked now about the three main people, about Vyasadeva, who is the author of the Vedas. We've talked about Sukadeva, who is Vyasadeva's son, and he's the person who explains the Vedas to Prickett. And we've talked about now Pariket, who is the person who will hear the Vedas from Vyasa, uh, from uh, Sukadev. So this again is stories from the Vedas. Today we've discussed a little bit about the um, Vedic knowledge. We've talked about the Vedas themselves. We've talked about uh, the process of devotion or bhakti. And we've talked about the people who will be the main communicators in getting this philosophy across. So next week we'll continue with describing 
why it was Prickett was cursed in the first place. And uh, we'll take this topic a little further. The following week after that, on the uh, 28th, that's when we'll have another um, What's Up With That? And we'll be talking about UFOs. That will be our main topic, and we'll talk about how the UFO phenomenon is discussed and explained from the Vedic perspective. So, stories from the Vedas, today is November 14th, and we've talked about the Bhagavatam, the actual writing that these uh, stories are coming from. There are many stories in the Bhagavatam, and each of them is uh, designed to help us understand something about spiritual life. The Bhagavatam is kind of like an encyclopedia of spiritual principles. And we learned about the people who were mainly there to explain it. We'll learn about some of the others who are also part of the various stories that make up Bhagavatam, but we'll learn about them as we go forward and discuss some of those stories. So, 26 Second Avenue, downtown Manhattan every Thursday around 7 o'clock uh, at 26 Second Avenue and East 1st Street. Uh, starting about 7, sometimes going to 8 and sometimes going to 9, that's when we do this particular um, presentation. So thank you all very much. Hare Krishna.